So after that, let's now look at the physical properties of alkenes. So the physical properties. So for the alkenes also, you'll notice that the melting and the boiling point increases down the group as the number of carbon atoms increases. So as the number of carbon atoms increases down the group, so also the melting point and the boiling point will increase down the group. As well, the density also is going to increase down the group as the number of carbon atoms increases down the group. So how do we prepare alkenes? So the alkenes can be prepared by using or by basically dehydrating ethanol with conch sulfuric acid. So you know that in the chemistry laboratory, conch sulfuric acid is a chemical which is mainly used in the drying of the different, in the drying of the different components in the laboratory. Now in this case, you can prepare an alkene by dehydrating ethanol with conch sulfuric acid in order to, uh, in order to prepare a thin. So for example, if you are dehydrating butanol, you are going to get butene. If you are going to dehydrate hexanol, we are going to get hexene. So in this experiment, we see that conch sulfuric, conch sodium hydroxide is used to remove traces of carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide that might be produced in the experiment. So remember, sulfuric acid dehydrates or removes water from the alcohol. Sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide removes carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide from the experiment. So you see that when ethanol and conch sulfuric acid is seated at 160 degrees Celsius, water will be removed from the ethanol as per the equation that you can see. So the ethanol at 160 degrees Celsius will be dehydrated. Water will be removed by the heat and the sulfuric acid, whereby the ethanol will be reduced to a thin gas, and then we are also going to form some traces of water molecule. So again, remember, sulfuric acid, conch sulfuric acid, is a very strong dehydrating agent which also dehydrates the alcohols to respective gases or to respective uh, alkenes. So the broken porcelain or the sand in the experiment, they are used to absorb the excess heat in order to prevent the bursting or the breaking down or the cracking of the apparatus during, heat, uh, during the process of heating. Sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, it is used to remove traces, uh, traces of sulfur dioxide or traces of the carbon dioxide that might, might be in the atmosphere and might turn to be impurities in the experiment. So you see that the ethene gas is collected over water method to imply that ethene gas is, is less soluble in water and it is less denser than air. So these are also other physical properties of the alkenes, at least the first four alkenes or the alkenes, because you see that alkenes also just like alkenes, they are less denser than water. So the density of water is very high compared to all the alkenes. And that is a reason why a thin gas can be able to be collected using over water method. And yeah, it can be collected using over water method because it is insoluble in water and also it is less denser. It is less denser than, than air. So you see that also this gas can be prepared by dehydrating ethanol with hot aluminum oxide. So if you use hot aluminum trioxide, we pass hot, so we heat, as per the experiment you see, so as per the experiment you can see that the, the aluminum trioxide is being heated and then after heating aluminum trioxide, hot fumes of ethanol are being passed over there, over the heated aluminum trioxide. So this aluminum trioxide is going to reduce the ethanol to a thin gas and water molecule as per how the reaction shows. So we are going to get a thin gas and then plus traces of water molecules to be formed. So in summary, these are the physical properties of the alkene. So first of all, these are colorless. They are, they are basically colorless, the gases and the liquids. So they are basically colorless. They are basically odorless. And then they are slightly soluble in water because in warm water, they tend to be soluble. But in cold water, they are highly insoluble in cold water. So just to generalize, we'll say they are slightly soluble in water. And then also we can say that they are highly soluble in organic solvents. So in organic solvents, they are highly soluble. Organic solvents or non-polar solvents. So in the polar solvents, like for example, water is a polar solvent they are slightly soluble. But in organic solvents, they are highly soluble. Organic solvents, like for example, we have oil, we have petrol, so things like that. 
the ones which do not have a polarity, non-polar solvents or organic solvents. So they are highly soluble in non-polar or organic solvents. Also, they do not conduct electricity. So why don't they conduct electricity? It's because they are non-polarized. So they don't have polarity, positive or negative. So since they don't have polarity, positive or negative, so they cannot be able to conduct electricity. Because you see that electricity follows a channel of positive and negative. So for these nonpolar solvents, we see that they only have one charge. So since they only have one charge of negative, it will mean that they cannot carry the other charge in the positive section. So since they cannot, we can say that they do not or they cannot conduct electricity. And then apart from that, we see that since they are unsaturated hydrocarbons, they produce a lot of soot when burnt. So remember alkanes, they are saturated hydrocarbons, alkanes, saturated hydrocarbons, so they don't produce soot when heated. Alkenes, they are unsaturated hydrocarbons, and therefore they produce heat, uh, they produce soot when heated. Why? Because they are unsaturated hydrocarbons. So apart from the physical properties, let's now look at the chemical properties of alkenes and let's begin with combustion, whereby uh, we say that in combustion, they burn in oxygen in order to produce carbon dioxide and water. So the carbon dioxide in this case will form a black mass, which is now called the soot. So if you heat any hydrocarbon, you are going to get two things. You're going to get carbon dioxide and water. So alkenes are hydrocarbons. If you heat them, you're going to get... Uh, carbon dioxide and water. So the quantity of carbon dioxide in alkenes during heating is very high and this forms a black mass which is now called the soot. So apart from that, another chemical property, we have additional reaction whereby this mainly involves adding other atoms to alkenes. Like maybe for example, if we add hydrogen, if we add kinabromine, if we add any. So if we add any atom to halogen, that is referred to as an additional reaction. So the, the alkenes, they undergo additional reaction. So this mainly occurs in the double bond region. So the double bond is always broken, and then after double bond has been broken, so the free electrons that are formed at the double bond, so the free electrons are the ones which are now, uh, which accommodate the other atoms which are now to join, to join the structure. So examples of additional reaction include uh, hydrogenation reaction, whereby in hydrogenation reaction, we react an alkene with hydrogen in the presence of nickel catalyst at 250 degrees Celsius. So that is the condition for hydrogenation reaction. So we react an alkene with hydrogen. Like for example, this experiment, you can see we are reacting an ethene, the reaction I mean, we are reacting ethene with hydrogen in the presence of nickel catalyst at between 150 to 250 degrees Celsius in order to get an alkene. So in halogenation, if we halogenate an alkene, we are going to get an alkene because we are destroying the double bond and adding hydrogen. So alkene in halogenation, nickel catalyst, uh, 250 degrees Celsius, we get an alkene. Apart from that, another example of additional reaction that we have, we have halogenation reaction. Now, in the halogenation reaction, this is mainly adding halogen to an alkene. So we add any member of the halogen to an alkene. The same, same thing happens. So the double bond is the one which breaks to accommodate the halogens. Like for example, if you can take again the ethene, so if we react ethene with chlorine, so the double bond is going to break, we are going to have free electrons, the two chlorines are going to join with the free electrons in order to form the dichloroethene. So that is exactly what is going to happen. So if ethene reacts with chlorine, so the two chlorine are going to react with the ethene. The double bond is going to break. We are going to have two free electrons. Then the chlorine is going to bond with two uh, these free electrons in order to form a compound. And the compound here that is going to be formed, the, the immediate compound to be formed is a dichloroethene. So that is uh, the structure which is going to be formed. As well, you can look at these other examples of the additional reaction whereby in halogenation as an additional reaction, we say that this is reacting an alkene with a member of the halogen. So if you react an alkene with the member of the halogen, so that experiment is called a halogenation reaction. So we can react chlorine, we can react bromine, we can react fluorine, any member of the halogen, even iodine. 
So iodine is, called, is going to be called iodo. So for the fluorine, fluorine will be called fluoro, chlorine will be called chloro, bromine will be called bromo, iodine will be called iodo in the structure. So like for example, we see bromine can be able to be dissolved in water. So if bromine is dissolved in water, it's going to, be, it's going to form a hypobromous acid. Now, we can react an alkene with this hypobromous acid. So, when the hypobromous acid is reacted with ethene, for example, it is going to form 2-bromoethanol, as you can see. So remember, we have dissolved bromine in water. After dissolving bromine in water, or also chlorine, or fluorine, or iodine, just that we are taking bromine as an example. If we dissolve bromine in water, we are going to get hypobromous acid. Now, if we dissolve this hypobromous acid, of, or if we react the hypobromous acid with ethene gas, so we are going to get 2-bromoethanol. So as you can see, that is the structure of the 2-bromoethanol that we are talking about. So that is also another example of the additional reaction. So for the additional reaction, so far we have looked at hydrogenation and halogenation. Now the third one, let's look at hydrohalogenation. So hydrohalogenation, this is now adding hydrogen halide, or rather this is reacting hydrogen halide to an alkene. Like for example, hydrogen halide, you can have hydrogen fluoride. Remember halides, members of the halogen group only. Only the group seven members are the halides. So the hydrogen halides, we can have hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen chloride, hydrogen bromide, hydrogen iodide. So if you react any of these hydrogen halides to alkenes, that is hydrohalogenation. Like for example, you can see this experiment, we react ethene with hydrogen bromide, and then we are going to get, uh, so we're going to get bromo, bromoethane, like you can see in the structure, bromoethane. We can also react hydrogen chloride to get chloroethane ETC. So that is also another additional reaction. So the first one is hydrogenation, the second one is halogenation, the third one is hydrohalogenation. Now the fourth one is polymerization reaction. So in this, in this polymerization reaction, what did you say polymerization reaction is? So remember we say that polymerization reaction is the process whereby we react different, we react different monomers in order to, or in order to get a polymer. So it's the process whereby we react the different monomers which have carbon chains in order to get a polymer. So this is also referred to as an additional reaction. So for example, you see, alkenes have the ability to react with each other, forming very long molecules of, uh, of the alkene. So a single molecule of an alkene is referred to as the monomer. That is a single molecule of an alkene is referred to as a monomer. Now, when these monomers react, very many monomers react together, they will form now that what is referred to as the polymer. As you can see in the diagram, so they will, they, they will now form what is referred to as the polymer. So during the reaction, we see that again, during this reaction, the double bond of each ethene is broken, forming a monomer with free electrons. Now, these free electrons between this one monomer and the other monomer, they come together to form a complete structure over there. So remember, during the reaction, the double bond of each, of each alkene, in this case, these are ethene, the double bond of each alkene breaks down. And as the double bond has broken down, we have free electrons. So e monoma moja, it can free electrons. E monoma ingine can free electrons. So this free electron of the, this one joins with this free electron of the second one, and then they form a long structure, which is referred to as the polymer. So that is also another example of an additional reaction for the alkenes. And then the other additional reaction you can see, uh, we have addition of uh, oxidizing reagents. Oxidizing reagents like potassium permanganate, potassium dichromate, so addition of oxidizing agents. So you see that, for example, when the tin is bubbled in acidified potassium permanganate, the purple color immediately discolorizes. The purple color of the potassium permanganate, potassium dichromate, will immediately discolorize. So why will the colors of this dichromate and permanganate discolorize? So these colors are going to discolorize to simply mean that the double bond has been broken, the free electrons have reacted with the, with the permanganate or the dichromate, 
forming another secondary compound. Now, this other secondary compound assumes another molecular formula and assumes another color. So that's why for the potassium permanganate being purple, we'll realize that the, the purple color has discolorized. The orange color in dichromate has discolorized. It's because these free electrons have reacted with this oxidizing agent to form another secondary compound, and this secondary compound will assume another color, will assume another taste, will assume another smell and another property. So the potassium permanganate, we see that it's a very strong oxidizing agent which mainly oxidizes alkenes to alcohols. So the alkenes are oxidized to alcohol. Like for example, if we oxidize ethene, we're going to get ethanol. If we oxidize butene, we are going to get butanol. So it oxidizes the alkenes to the different alcohols that there is. So the oxygen is then added to the double bond, which is mainly accommodated at the double bond region. So this oxidizing agent gives out oxygen. So this oxygen goes and bonds in the double bond region. So if it bonds at the double bond region, it will mean that that structure will cease to be an alkene because you see that the property of alkene, they have a double bond. So if they don't have a double bond anymore, so it will mean that they have ceased to be alkenes. So this potassium permanganate, after giving out the oxygen, it ceases to be an oxidizing agent. So these are two different, two different compounds altogether. So you see that for the potassium permanganate, the manganate seven ions will be reduced to manganese two ions and water. Now these are the secondary compounds or the secondary chemicals that I was talking about. So the potassium permanganate ceases to be the purple potassium permanganate and now becomes another secondary compound altogether. Now, this experiment or this reaction shows a reaction between ethene and potassium permanganate in the presence of an acid. Or we can say a reaction between ethene and acidified potassium permanganate. So you can see that at the double bond region, so in the double bond, one electron has gone to this carbon atom, the other electron has gone to this carbon atom, and then one oxygen has captured, uh, one of the electrons in this carbon atom, one oxygen has captured, in order to obtain a structure which is called a uh, diol. So as you can look at the name of the structure, this structure is called ethian 12 diol So it is ethian 12 diol it is eth, eth to mean that it is two carbons eth to mean two carbons, and then the first OH. OH in a hydrocarbon means that this is an alcohol. So in a hydrocarbon, if you see OH, OH simply shows that this is an alcohol. So in this structure, we have OH. So OH means that this one is now an alcohol, so it is ethanol. So in this case, it will mean that the first OH is in carbon number one, the second OH is in carbon number two. So this structure will be called eth to mean that it is, we have two carbons, and then to identify where the first OH is, it is in one, the second OH coapi is in carbon number two, and then we have two, two of them. So remember, if we have two, we are going to call it di. If we had three, we could have said tri. If we had four, we could have said tetra. So here, OH are two, they are alcohol. So we are going to say ethian one comma two hyphen diol, to represent that we have two OH. So that is the name of the structure, ethian 1, 2, diol. So that's the structure. As well, we see that when alkenes react with acidified potassium dichromate, uh, as you can see, potassium dichromate, the orange color will fade from being orange to green. Or rather, I can say the orange color will change from being orange to green color. In this case, we'll see that the chromate ions will be reduced to chromium-3 ions, as you can see. So the chromate ions will be reduced to chromium-3 ions in order to form the acetate ions and the acetic acid for, like for example, the structure that we have. So also, the alkenes can be able to react with conch sulfuric acid. So if these alkenes react with conch sulfuric acid, so there's going to be the formation of a hydrogen sulfate, an alkyl hydrogen sulfate. Like for example, you see this example here, we have ethene reacting with conch sulfuric acid. So if ethene reacts with conch sulfuric acid, we are going to get ethyl hydrogen sulfate, as you can see. It is represented with HSO4. So we're going to get ethyl hydrogen sulfate. So remember, alkenes can be able to react with conch sulfuric acid as another chemical property. So if they react with conch sulfuric acid, we are going to get an alkyl hydrogen sulfate. 
And then this alkyl hydrogen sulfate, remember, the double bond is the one which is breaking to release the electrons, and then that foreign compound will bound to these free electrons in order to achieve ethyl hydrogen sulfate if it reacts with the ethene gas. So when this ethyl hydrogen sulfate is added to water or water is added to the ethyl hydrogen sulfate, we are going to go back to the previous, uh, whereby we started, we're going to go, go back to the alcohol that we started with. So when the ethyl hydrogen sulfate will be added in water, so we are going to get an alcohol plus sulfuric acid. So that is what we are going to obtain. In fact, it's not the previous. This is another different thing altogether. So an ethyl hydrogen sulfate is added in water, so we're going to get an alcohol plus sulfuric acid in aqueous form. So like for example, if we react ethene plus sulfuric acid, conch sulfuric acid that is, we're going to get ethyl hydrogen sulfate. If we take this ethyl hydrogen sulfate and react it with water molecules, we are going to get ethanol plus sulfuric acid, which is dilute sulfuric acid. So how is it possible to test for the presence of alkenes? So how can we be able to test for the presence of alkenes? So there's only one test, or there are two tests by which you can be able to test for the presence of alkenes and say that these are alkenes or these are alkenes. So how can we be able to test for the presence of alkenes? Simple. You bubble the gas or the liquid in bromine water, potassium permanganate or potassium dichromate. If they are able, if that sub sample is able to discolorize, you'll say that this is an alkene, as simple as that. If you burn it and it produces soot, that is another test for the alkenes. So we have two tests uh, by which you can be able to use to test for the presence of alkenes. So the first test, if they discolorize bromine water, if it discolorizes bromine water, potassium permanganate or potassium dichromate, that is an alkene. If you burn that substance, it produces soot, that is an alkene. So those are the two main tests for the testing of the presence of alkenes. So apart from that, let's now look at the uses. So how can we be able to use the different alkenes that we have? So how can we be able to use? So you see that alkenes, they are mainly used in the manufacture of plastic. Like for example, we have the polythene bags, we have the, bus, uh, the buckets, we have the cups that we use at home, the polythene cups we use at home in the process of polymerization. So through the process of polymerization, we can be able to make baskets, the buckets, the plastic buckets, we can be able to make the baskets, yes. We can be able to make the different toys that we have, anything plastic. Uh, is a use of an alkene. So you can use alkene to make anything of plastic. So also we can see that the alkenes, they are used in making of uh, alcohol through hydrolysis process. Like for example, the one that we have just seen. We react ethene plus sulfuric acid and then the ethyl hydrogen sulfate, we react it with water molecules to get an alcohol. So you can be able to, to manufacture alcohol uh, using alkenes through the process of hydrolysis. Hydrolysis means addition of water to a substance. So addition of water to a suitable alkene in order to get the different alcohols that we need. So also for alkenes, another use is that it is used in the making of the different detergents that we have. It is also used in ripening of fruits. It is also used in, in making the coolants, uh, the coolants for the petrol engines. Like for example, the manufacture of ethan 1 to diol which is mainly used to prevent knocking of the engines basically a coolant for the engines in short it is used in making the coolant for the petrol engines that we have also in the manufacture of polystyrene used in car battery cases so that car battery case which is very it's always very strong it's called the polystyrene so that is also another use of the of the alkenes as we know it